The next panel, I think, uh, brings forward some uh, and addresses some issues that uh, we haven't really talked about much over the past day and a, and a half. Uh, the title of this panel is Experiences with Crew Return Recovery Systems and Post-Recovery Observation and Standards of Care. The uh, panel is led by uh, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey uh, Sutton, who is the director of the National Space Biomedical Research Institute. And Jeff, if you'd introduce your panel, uh, panelists. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alford. Right, going down from uh, my right and uh, down the table, uh, first we have uh, Ken Bowersox, who's a, a NASA astronaut and veteran of five flights, as you know, and uh, was commander of Expedition 6. And then we have uh, Mike Fink, also a NASA astronaut who served uh, as a science officer and flight engineer aboard uh, the ISS Expedition 9. And then uh, we're very honored to have uh, Dr. Vladimir Bochoyev, who's the uh, chief medical officer at Star City. He's had an experience with uh, more than uh, 30 post-landing crew recoveries and observations. It's hard to see from this angle. Sam Poole. Dr. Sam Poole, uh, as uh, folks know, um, was a former NASA flight surgeon with extensive experience going back to the Apollo program. And then uh, there's Dr. Joe Kerwin, who uh, uh, was the first uh, U.S. medical doctor to fly in space and um, was the uh, silent science uh, pilot uh, aboard Skylab 2, and I think brings a unique perspective of having done a water landing. And uh, at the very end of the table, uh, we're thrilled to have Dr. Richard Jennings, who's the Chief of Aerospace Medicine Residency at the, the University of Texas Medical Branch. Well, thank you very much for the honor of uh, being here before uh, so many distinguished uh, international colleagues and friends. This panel has uh, three components to the topic. Uh, the first um, has to do with crew return recovery systems. Uh, the second is post-recovery observations and the third has to do with standards of care. The standards of care, of course, is a common theme that has gone through a number of the panels. Uh, certainly the panel uh, just prior to this that Dr. Mike Duncan chaired and also the panel yesterday that uh, Kathy Larini chaired. What I'd like to do is to uh, uh, just mention a few talking points uh, for this panel that uh, concerns the other two topics that are in the title. That really has to do with post-flight landing medical support, uh, off-nominal re-entry and landing support, for example, when the landing site's unknown, uh, the health care to support uh, rehabilitation to minimize illness or injury due to the deconditioned state, uh, a return to activities of normal daily living, and where applicable, uh, especially given the uh, frequency of, of uh, repeat flyers, the return to flight status, and also uh, the long-term health effects monitoring and certainly the uh, issues related to uh, the longitudinal study of astronaut health and other studies uh, are very important and so perhaps uh, some of the panelists and uh, some of you can bring this up in discussions. So without further ado, I think maybe we'll just uh, work our way down uh, the table here. So okay. Ken, do you want to lead off, please? Yeah. Um, well. I wanted to start just a little bit about talking about um, coming back from space. Um, I've been lucky enough to do that five times. Um, and each time coming back was uh, just about as big an adventure as going up. Uh, the first four times uh, I returned by shuttle, um, the flights were relatively short uh, on the order of two weeks each. And uh, the symptoms uh, on return uh, for me uh, the, the, the most significant symptom were um, neurovestibular symptoms, uh, uh, muscle coordination, neurosensory uh, issues that subside fairly quickly. Um, on the fifth flight, um, I came home in a Soyuz after five and a half months, and the, uh, the experience was similar to the shorter duration flights, uh, 
Um, but much, much stronger. The, the symptoms, uh, the neurovestibular symptoms were much, much stronger. Um, on the four shuttle flights, I found that uh, with each flight, uh, my body seemed to know how to readapt more quickly each time. But uh, even after, you know, uh, four of those <coughs> short flights, the fifth flight was still much, much uh, more significant and the symptoms were much stronger. Um, the uh, especially interesting thing about the fifth flight was that we surprised our uh, recovery crew and, and uh, landed somewhere where they were not. Uh, and so we were able to spend about four or five hours in uh, the steppe of Kazakhstan, enjoying the peace and quiet, waiting for the recovery forces to arrive. Um, uh, I feel very fortunate that we had that opportunity for uh, a few reasons. Uh, one reason being, uh, on, on my very first flight, uh, the um, length of the mission was planned to be about 13 days, and at the time, that was considered very long for a shuttle flight. Um, and we were concerned about things like um, whether or not the crew would uh, even be able to egress in emergency situations uh, after coming back uh, in a couple weeks. So when we were in Kazakhstan laying there in the Soyuz, I thought, all right, this is great. We're going to get our chance to get out of the vehicle by ourselves and see if we can really do it. Um, and what I'll tell you is, yeah, we could. It, it was not that hard. Um, because of the good work that has been done by, uh, by people in your community, um, our strength, our coordination uh, it was sufficient to get out of the vehicle. Um, in, in fact, I'll tell you that our peak strength was not that much different than when we left because of the uh, exercise equipment that's been designed and the countermeasures that we already have. Um, the, uh, the thing that was difficult, though, after we landed was uh, the uh, neurovestibular symptoms that we experienced. Now, those symptoms could be made to go away by not moving. <laughs> so if you lay very still on the ground, you won't have a problem. <laughs> Um, and it has to be something very important for you to want to, to move and excite <laughs> those symptoms. Uh, but if there's something important to be done, uh, it can be done. And, and the, uh, the coordination is sufficient after even five months in space. Um, I think uh, our experience is going to be a lot like what uh, people uh, find when they first land on Mars uh, after a... Uh, after a six-month journey, <laughs> they'll, they'll tumble down onto the Martian surface. Uh, there'll be no one there to meet them, uh, and they'll have to function. Now, um, from my experience, it'll probably be a few days before they're ready to, to operate at 100%. Um, but uh, if there's something that needs to be done in an emergency, even with the current state of our countermeasures, uh, I believe they'll be able to function and they'll be able to, uh, to uh, accomplish basic survival tasks in the, sh in the short term. Um, as, as you guys work on your, uh, as your, on your projects and uh, experiments, um, I think there's something to be gained from the Expedition 6 experience, um, and, and that is perfection is not required. Um, the human organism is very strong. It has a tremendous uh, capability to adapt. Uh, and, and desire and adrenaline can overcome many, many problems. The key is to make sure that the, the human is still capable uh, and that we can do the job well enough. Um, we don't have to have perfection in all of our studies, although that's a great goal to strive for. We don't have to exactly match performance pre-flight. We just have to make sure that the performance is good enough. And uh, I hope you'll remember that as you're designing your studies, that we want to make sure that we design uh, to, for good enough and for a high enough level of security and safety. Well, I, I certainly haven't had enough uh, experience to match Captain Bowersox, uh, but I agree with him uh, on our experience on Expedition 9, uh, uh, 100%. Uh, we had uh, neurovestibular issues on on return, but uh, the actual strength and 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 such was uh, w was was I think good enough, and uh, we certainly uh, recovered uh, pretty quickly. And so I think uh, we didn't uh, we were met uh, by a, a distinct group of of uh, landing and recovery specialists. But I like to think that uh, we could have uh, walked or crawled out of our, our vehicle because we were on their side, so it wouldn't have been so easy to walk out. But uh, we could have walked uh, really quickly afterwards. Um, we, didn't, we weren't given the opportunity, but we felt that strong. 
And so uh, I'd like to echo uh, Ken in saying that uh, what we've done so far is 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 significant. After six months, uh, we we still felt pretty strong uh, after landing. And if if there's anything that's uh, uh, again, like Ken said, that's going to uh, slow us down on on the return uh, down to Mars, for example, we would uh, the one third gravity will help. But if we have any way to fix neurovestibular issues, like we fixed uh, maybe some of the the strength and conditioning issues so far, then we're uh, then then we could uh, work sort of right away. But then, like Ken was saying, also, what's what requirement do we have once we land on Mars to to be ready to work right away? There's no emergency. We should be able to take a, a couple of days to get our uh, bearings, to get our uh, balance, so to speak, back. It's going to be a little bit different because I don't think any of us will have a 130 gravity experience until then. But uh, the variability of humans and, and our adaptability, I think we'll be able to uh, to really uh, adapt to uh, landing on Mars uh, relatively quickly. Again, just exactly what uh, Captain Bauer Sox was saying. So uh, I'd like to just talk a little bit uh, about the post-recovery observations uh, a little bit. Uh, in that uh, our experience uh, after after coming back from six months in space, uh, we stayed at Star City. We, again, we landed in a Soyuz also, uh, stayed in Star City. It was, uh, uh, and we had a, a very strong uh, and a appropriate uh, rehabilitation program there. And, uh, um, and I was very glad to see that there's, uh, uh, that each of our uh, uh, conditioning and, and, and rehabilitation specialists really uh, I should say strength conditioning and rehabilitation specialists, uh, really uh, tailored the program to match the individuals they return. Every person who comes back from space is different. And, uh, and there's uh, several approaches to, to rehab. Uh, there's a take it easy approach, you know, swim for a couple weeks and maybe move to walking fast and then maybe running after a couple months. And uh, for me, that wouldn't have worked because uh, I, I wanted to be running and playing with my kids right away. I had a, a, a new baby while I was on, well, my wife had the baby. Um, <laughs> I had a new baby on board and I had a, th a three-year-old and I wanted to play with my kids. So I, I was ready to, to go, get going faster. And, uh, and, and we had the flexibility to, to do the pay up front program. Uh, where you know I was uh, working out, out pretty uh, hard, but again at the rate that I individually could handle, not just some prescription that works for eight out of ten astronauts or cosmonauts on return. It was tailored to my individual uh, self, and that was a that was a very effective way. Um, so I was able to get back on my feet, so to speak, and uh, play with my kids uh, very quickly thanks to a flexible program. So I'd like to suggest that uh, as we look further into uh, more space station flights and to the moon and Mars that we actually understand that people are different. Each astronaut and cosmonaut is different and uh, we each have a slight, like to probably need a, a slightly different approach to how we do things and one size does not fit all. What is Dr. The approach and the program that we uh, were offered to discuss today is really varied. Our dear esteemed astronauts uh, started talking about the post-flight recovery, and I will continue with that topic. In my opinion, uh, there are three factors that can impact the post-flight recovery. First of all was the initial physical state of the crew member. What is being done? Lately, we have been advancing the medical selection criteria as well as the medical program prior to the flight during training. We know if uh, the crew member is in a healthier state, and if he, he has a big physiological reserves, then he can adequately react to some adverse effects of the flight, and he will be able to recover quicker and feel much better post-landing in comparison with another individual whose initial health state was not as high. The next factor that I need to know is the duration of space missions and the impact of the duration of the flight on the health status. In the 80s, we made a conclusion that the health status uh, is related to the duration of the flight, but these conclusions were made when we had the SALUT program. 
So when we had uh, flights uh, in duration varying from 211 days to 237 days, we had five cosmonauts who uh, flew those missions and we saw that they had some deviations in their health status, but the general conclusion of the crew members was if there was an off-nominal landing, the crew members would be able to survive and would be able to wait for the help. And this was really uh, good to see that. There was also a document drafted out in Russia where doctors wanted to notify the upper management that we need to diminish the duration of the flight. And the doctors were trying to say that we cannot keep extending the duration of the flight. But while they were drafting out the paperwork, you know how it works, uh, we launched the Mir space station, and the Mir space station had larger capabilities and larger uh, resources for countermeasures. And the third factor that can impact the post-flight uh, recovery is the onboard systems and the countermeasures available on board. In my opinion, if the crew member uses the available resources for physical training, uh, countermeasures, then post-flight recovery will be much easier. And we have a myriad of examples to demonstrate that. We have uh, Valery Polikov, who is our cosmonaut and uh, doctor. He flew uh, over 400 days, and he wanted to demonstrate that if the crew member is using the resources on board correctly, then there are not uh, severe adverse effects on the health of the crew member post-flight. I participated in his rehabilitation, and I can say that his state was better despite the fact that he flew for so many days than the condition of those crew members who flew half the duration of that flight. Therefore, the post-flight status is a mirror of the state of the onboard system. So if the crew member is using those resources correctly, if he is making a conscious effort to follow all the procedures and countermeasure plan, Pavel Vinogradov was saying yesterday that he was happy that there was a choice. We have a choice of resources. We can use this this uh, uh, trainer or, or that uh, equipment for physical exercises. In a year, we'll have six crew members on board the ISS, and today is the high time for us to think about advancing our resources on board the ISS to provide a wider selection of uh, equipment so the crew members would have a choice, the crew members would be motivated uh, to have uh, physical exercises, and this will improve their health condition after the flight. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> with regard to rehabilitation, um, one can ask the question, is it going to be necessary? If you look at uh, flights to the moon with relatively short transit times, I doubt uh, very much that it will be necessary. On the other hand, uh, missions to the Mars probably will require some sort of uh, rehabilitation capability, if nothing else, to get you active and functional uh, with fairly high performance as soon as possible. Uh, then that, that also then asks the question, well, okay, what are you going to do? Can you improve by simply doing a better job of exercising during the mission? Or is there something special that will still be required on the Martian surface to accelerate your recovery and give you the full capability to do an EVA or, or whatever. Um, it also occurs to me that there are some, some uh, less than rosy uh, uh, pictures about uh, our ability to do this. If you look at a study we did on shuttle to look at egress, we did a pre-flight study, P-1, 
people suited in trying to go, I think, I forget, 100 yards or longer to get away from the shuttle, uh, suited in the suit that they would launch in or return in, and then after the flight. And to our astonishment and chagrin, we found that a fair number of them, even pre-flight, could not accomplish this task given what they were wearing. Mm -hmm. It was simply not possible. And uh, uh, that kind of experience needs to be thought about fairly carefully if you're going to try to do a, a rapid egress on the Martian surface, because I think you'll encounter the same kind of problem. And of course, when we came back on the shuttle, even a fewer, a smaller number uh, could accomplish this uh, task, which involved running suited on a treadmill, I think, something like that. So maybe, maybe we, uh, <laughs> the other thing about it, I think, is that <clears throat> I've been often struck by uh, a young flight surgeon who goes to a mission recovery and, uh, and his crew does really well, and therefore all crews do really well. And I can remember in my early training in medicine uh, some similar experiences. I would grasp an experience and say, well, okay, that's the way patients behave. And it's not, in fact, the way many patients re behave because of the wide, wide variability. And I think it's reasonable to expect that it, it, given the size of the crew going to Mars, that uh, maybe one or two of them might not be as uh, capable as others in the crew because of that human variability and may need more help in the rehabilitation area uh, to, uh, to rapidly recover. With regard to neurovestibular, that's a particularly difficult question for us in the, in the medical world because I don't think we know how to, to do it other than to uh, let tincture of time and uh, exposure to head movements in a gravitational field uh, let you recover. And uh, so that may be one of the biggest things we have to worry about, and I'm not sure we have the, uh, the understanding necessary to, to do much about it. Jeff asked me to <clears throat> comment about water landing, uh, and my first comment is I don't really recommend it for future <laughs> programs. Uh, <clears throat> We, we had a saying about terra firma, which was, the more firmer, the less terror. Uh, but, you know, I think, I think the United States selected water landing uh, uh, early on because there's a lot of water out there, and we had a big worldwide Navy. But that's a very expensive way of conducting a recovery program, especially if you have to cover multiple landing sites, as we did during, during Apollo. Uh, it... Uh, it has a couple drawbacks. Uh, the uh, the seasickness uh, possibility is uh, is added to physiologic de deconditioning, and I'll tell you my story about that in, in a minute if I get time. Uh, you might be upside down for a while if the capsule turns over and and goes into stable too, and that adds to your to your troubles a, a little bit. On the other hand, it's a less demanding reentry task to land on parachutes than to uh, than to land a vehicle like uh, like the shuttle. Uh, and uh, if I don't forget, I'll make a comment about that as well. So uh, I think that sort of sums up the, uh, the water landing experience. Uh, the key, I think, in talking about reentry and landing is performance. And it's, it's not only performance after landing, as on Mars, but performance during the reentry and landing, too. And there are two aspects to that. One is deconditioning, and the other one is, your, is, is your training still current? Uh, and if you've been up there for a long period of time, uh, flight surgeons all know that uh, if pilots don't fly for two or three months, uh, they get rusty in their uh, in their skills and, uh, and and have to practice a little bit to 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 recover them. Uh, and we've had, uh, from anecdotal information, at least a, a a couple of incidents early in the shuttle program, uh, where. Uh, pilots who did not get their hands on the on the uh, on the controls early in the reentry enough to overcome the change in eye hand muscle coordination that occurs when you're weightless, uh, and re-coordinate that. Jack Lausman is, is is a case in point. He took over from the automatic system at 200 feet, and that was almost too late. Uh, and Ken Mattingly made some interesting comments about that phenomenon of having to readapt uh, and needing time to do it. Uh, but
but uh, other than that, the, uh, the, the deconditioning problems on, uh, on short flights, certainly in the olden days, were not very serious. We had a number of incidents. We had Carpenter's overflight of his uh, landing site, uh, but that wasn't, uh, certainly was not a deconditioning problem. Uh, Grissom's loss of the Mercury hatch uh, <clears throat> was a mechanical failure. Uh, the Gemini 7 overflight uh, of their landing site was a computer programming error. They forgot that the Earth was going around the sun. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, in, uh, in, in Gemini 8 was an interesting case because uh, due to a, uh, a propulsion failure on orbit, they had to make an emergency landing to an area where the Navy was not. Uh, and that put them into a water survival situation. Uh, and and I th I'm sure the Russian program has experienced some similar land survival situations where you're down and, and your recovery team is, is not there. We've had one or two Apollo crew members pass out in the shower on, on, on landing day. Uh, and uh, on Apollo 13, we had uh, Fred Hayes' kidney infection, which was environmental. This was, this was not a long flight. Uh, and the, uh, the hydrazine, in, in, the hydrazine insul in, inhalation problem uh, on the, during recovery uh, on the ASTP uh, flight was, uh, was pilot error, uh, leaving a valve open, uh, uh, and uh, so on. But, but by and large, those are not related to uh, physiologic de deconditioning on, uh, on, sh on, on short flights. Uh, our long flight experience, and, and, I, and, and, and I can really relate only to Skylab, and there's been extensive experience that just that just uh, confirms what our observations were, uh, was that, yes, there is a decrement. And uh, when we came back from the uh, first flight after a month, uh, uh, we probably had more decrement, certainly at least as much as any of the other two Skylab flights. And even, even among our crew, uh, you could see immediately that the amount of decrement on landing day uh, and it did recover quickly, just as all your experience has, uh, has, uh, sh has shown, was pretty much inversely proportional to the amount of exercise done by the crewman during flight. That was the first glimmer that, hey, exercise is a real effective countermeasure. We had better do more of it and learn more about it. Uh, my own experience was probably the worst of the three crew. I had done less exercise than, uh, than Pete or Paul. Uh, I also invented fluid loading. Uh, but did it wrong and swallowed a strawberry drink in the command module on the water uh, during this thing and got seasick and threw up in, in sick bay and was totally miserable on that first day. That was a bad mistake, but it was a great invention. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the guys on the, uh, on the longer flights uh, 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 certainly uh, came back with, uh, with, uh, with a lot of both neurovestibular and... Uh, and uh, uh, cardiovascular uh, problems. Uh, Al Bean, I will mention, uh, uh, moved his suitcase in his stateroom on the first night and hurt his back fairly, fairly se uh, severely, and that set back his recovery and returned to flight by a, by a couple of weeks. It's something you have to look out for. Uh, Jack Lausma was recovering rapidly, but uh, uh, one day at, at home, he uh, picked up the shaving lotion with one hand and attempted to toss it to the other hand with the kind of quick push that would have done the job on Skylab, I'm quoting him, pow, right in the sink, smash the bottle. A <laughs> uh, lot of incidents like, like that. Ed Gibson, quote, then I did a dumb thing. About four days after landing, I felt better than I thought I might, so I figured I ought to stop lollygagging around and get back to my standard exercise a nice, relaxed five-mile run. Wrong thing to do. <laughs> Muscles and joints scream pain at me for the next two weeks. So this was the germ of, uh, of uh, us figuring out that, that a rehab program might, might be a good idea uh, after, uh, after long missions. Uh, I'll just tell you one quick story about uh, training currency, which also occurred on the last Skylab mission, the 84-day mission. And I'll quote Bill Pogue. The problem came after we had separated from the service module. I looked over at Jerry as he was moving the hand controller to get the right entry attitude, which we absolutely had to be at, and nothing was happening. I yelled, go direct, <laughs> and it worked. When you hit the hard stops, you had a direct ele electrical path to the, uh, to the jets. Uh, and uh, he got the thing into the approximate entry attitude and, uh, and uh, threw it into autopilot, which uh, steered us through reentry. 
Afterward, we found out that Jerry had inadvertently pulled all the circuit breakers to the command module thrusters instead of the service module thrusters after service module set. Oop. The command module breakers were right above those for the, uh, for the service module. Now, that's a training currency thing. It's also a human factors thing. And both of those lessons need to be retained. I'll keep mine short because I know the questions and comments are more fun than this. Uh, uh, when I was uh, working STS-29, this was the first, second launch I'd seen, but the first as a crew surgeon, I took my daughter to the launch. And when she finally got back to Houston, I uh, said, well, what'd you think of the launch? Because it was really impressive to me and I was excited by it. And she said, well, they went up. And that was it. I was real disappointed. And, and my talk about landing could be, well, well, they came back. Uh, I had the opportunity to work about uh, 20 different uh, crew recoveries. I had, uh, since I know weather pretty well, I usually ended up at the right landing site to work the landings. But only two of those have been for long duration missions. So most of my work is in short duration missions. And, and there's really not that much neither. I think it was Gordon Cooper in the 22 Rev Mercury flight where they first saw orthostatic intolerance. And, and the same cast of thieves we still work with when I worked the landing April 21st uh, that, that have been around for a long time. And the one thing I've noticed though in working all these shuttle missions is how variable this is. Some people really just aren't that bothered in a short duration flight. Uh, some people are. We've had people that had motion sickness so bad that after three or four days we actually did MRIs to rule out brain tumors because why are they still so sick and people who stay in bed for three or four days. And if, just like has been mentioned, if you don't, moving your head helps, but if you don't move your head then you don't readapt to 1G. So you almost have to force people to do a little. Uh, we also, Truthfully, there's more events happen than that would be in the media probably. Because I think if a flight surgeon's doing a good job, people do pass out in the shower and they pass out other places. We've given you know IV fluids to get people off of shuttles. Things happen when we put in the new launch and entry suit. We had a huge increase in the amount of orthostatic intolerance. But for the most part, if your flight surgeon's doing a good job, these things are transparent to the public unless it happens when you're at a microphone at a welcoming home ceremony. But uh, truthfully, there's a little more, even on short duration flights, there's a little more problem with certain crew members and is, is generally recognized, I think. The other thing, though, is there's just this huge difference between long duration flight and short duration flights. Uh, having worked now two of those and comparing, say, uh, Greg Olson and Charles Simone to the long duration crew members, there's this huge difference that you see in people who've been in space a long time. and. Uh, but even there, there's this great variability where I look over and one of the persons is unconscious essentially in their chair getting ammonia under their nose and the other person is doing real well. And uh, just a tremendous variation. And, uh, but generally, you know, pretty fragile for the first couple of days. And the questions as a, as a flight surgeon I have, we always play what if at NASA. And, uh, you know, we did baboon experiments where we, we took 20 and 40 percent of their circulating blood volume and then put them in a, in a centrifuge and did uh, ballistic entry profiles and nominal entry profiles and just looked at the outcome. Of course, these baboons hadn't been into space and, and makes a pretty big difference if they're 40 uh, percent volume depleted. So when I look at these individuals, and again, based on both the U.S. and the Russian recovery systems, a nominal person I think is going to do fine. We have, we have good, uh, good uh, systems in place. But I have this nagging concern, what if they'd had an MI that we're bringing them back after six months with an MI, or what if they'd had a ruptured appendix, or what if they'd had a GI bleed and their volume depleted 15 percent from space, and now their volume depleted and we're doing the recovery, and that kind of worries me a little bit. Uh, if we have someone who's sick plus this kind of recovery thing that we see. The other thing is after 46 years, we've never put somebody to sleep after space flight. Uh, I wonder what if we give, you know, if we take them in, can we give them the sucks and STP and use some junk, you know, sublimase and Versed and all of these things, someone right back from space flight. Uh, we really don't have any data about that. If this person, say, had a traumatic fracture of a femur and they've lost two or three units there and they're already 15% down, how are we going to manage their fluid replacement? Uh, we, we're going to do central lines. I think all of this needs to be looked at and, and uh, thought about quite a bit because do this stuff long enough, 
it will happen. You will see these things. Uh, and so uh, I think people nominally do do real well, but I think that we need to be looking at what if it's a contingency landing where, where we do have a medical issue and how we're going to how we're going to take care of them. Yes, I have a quick uh, anecdotal comment uh, regarding what Joe Kerwin said about Mattingly. Uh, Jim Vanderplug and I were the flight surgeons on his shuttle mission. And uh, I had the privilege of debriefing him after the flight, so I'm all ready uh, to uh, go into my space motion sickness questions and so on. And he looks at me and he says, the recorder on? Yes, sir. Uh, he said, first of all, I had an input-output offset. When I moved the controller, it did not respond as it did in my training. I had to relearn rather quickly what that uh, meant. Second is, if I looked at the overhead uh, switches, I really tumbled my gyros. And um, in more recent shuttle flights, we have somebody sitting behind them who I think takes care of uh, the overhead switches. And the third thing, um, there were only two people on this mission, and so things were pretty active. Um, he said, I had time compression. And as I understand it, test pilots uh, talk about time compression when they miss events that they would normally have expected to witness. Uh, in the process of reentry, so even on short missions, and this was a very short mission, uh, recovery can present some interesting neurovestibular changes. Right, um, it's very interesting, and uh, I wanted to thank uh, the panelists for the uh, sharing with us their thoughts and experiences. And before opening up um, the discussion period, I had uh, one question that I just wanted to. Uh, uh, have folks um, give a response to, and that is that if there is one thing uh, that could be changed to improve uh, the crew uh, return recovery systems or the post-recovery period, uh, what would it be? One, one improvement. Um, from what I've seen with the U.S. side, and, and some of these steps have already been taken since my mission, uh, when crews come back, um, they'll look great but there are things going on that are much more subtle than, than are displayed. And uh, the pace of recovery uh, for our U.S. Uh, crewmen, we could probably uh, allow it to slow down a little bit. Um, I know for me, I, I went through um, the, the standard program, and then at six months, I went back to work and, uh, and uh, went up to NASA headquarters. Well, that was a big mistake. <laughs> Probably going to headquarters would have been a big mistake any time. But, uh, but, but doing it that at six months after a flight, I, I felt great. But when I went up there, I found I was much more uh, sensitive to the, to the stress and pressure of the job. And that just a few more months uh, probably would have been really wise. And uh, we've been trying to encourage our folks uh, who come back from long duration missions to take more time to, uh, to recuperate. And I know in the Russian program, the, the folks uh, have a, a, um, a much more gentle recuperation period, rehabilitation period. And I think it's something they've learned uh, through experience. Great. Uh, thanks again, Mike. Yeah, once again, I find myself uh, agreeing with uh, Ken. Uh, it's not it's it's not just a recovery after uh, months aboard the space station or on Mars. It's the years and years of training up to it. I mean, we trained for four years first as a backup crew, then as a prime crew, and uh, it's not in in the spirit of was it cooperation and collaboration. We really need to uh, we 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 go back and forth to many different countries nowadays. It's uh, not just U.S. and Russia, but the, our training includes time in Japan. And which we are grateful for, and in Europe, and in Germany. And this is uh, very good, except it takes us away from our families. We're tired of all this uh, travel back and forth after so many uh, years. And then uh, six months aboard the space station, plus uh, recovery time, and then we get back, and uh, it seems everybody in the world wants to talk with us, and who are we to be selfish to say no? And then all of a sudden, you know, it, it can get uh, really uh, uh, exhausting. And uh, so th these things need to be uh, balanced, and uh, we, we really need to be able to uh, to to uh, know when to take a day off. Because it's not just the mission, because that's that's only six months. And some people say, oh, that's a long time. No, compared to the four years plus a year afterwards, it's the six months is actually the short part, the easy part. 
and it's the it's the pre and, and post that are that are something that we need to uh, really pay pay attention to. And finally, on uh, again, I, I'm really glad that our systems have flexibility. When I came back, I was uh, after all this time and six months and the the, the re shock of re of recovery and landing and things. Uh, we went straight into rehab and we went straight into debriefing, and I never got a break. I mean, I've been working pretty much every day for six months, not to mention the time up there. And I I just finally said time out. Can I I just have a day off. It's a Sunday. I just want to sit down with my family and have a normal Sunday because I hadn't had a weekend in a long time. And our system looked at, you know, the folks in the system said, oh, that's a reasonable request, and they gave it to me. And so thanks for giving it to me. But we need to, we need to keep that in... We need to keep that in mind too. It's like it's like everybody's waiting for the crew to come back. Yay, the crew's back. They're safe. Now let's get to work. And it's like whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I've been working for a while already. So that's something to to keep keep in mind also is to is to pace ourselves so that we can max perform not just during the mission but so we can max perform for the best recovery. Thanks, uh, Dr. Petroyev. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Well, I would not uh, really undertake the responsibility and courage to tell you what is one factor that needs to be done in order to improve uh, the process of rehabilitation. This is a multifaceted process, and you, so you can't uh, drag one system out of all the complex of works that are done. Uh, you know, all the aspects are important during the pre-flight training and the flight itself, and the post-flight stage is extremely important since we must not forget such an issue as uh, professional longevity of our astronauts and cosmonauts. Cosmonauts and astronauts are, uh, you can say, a highly technological uh, staff, and we've invested a lot of uh, materials, resources, and work into making sure that they're the best, and they need uh, to, well, provide uh, provide uh, their contribution, which is their flights. Uh, that is what they give us back. So the improvement of their career longevity, I believe, is very important. And so we must not forget that during rehabilitation, because it makes it dependent on how well you perform their rehabilitation, is how well their bodies will restore. And so to determine when they can start training again and uh, when they can uh, continue with their professional life is quite important. And um, there is a whole set of issues, and I don't think that they can be separated. After the flight, we need to not only rehabilitate uh, by physical rehabilitation or other methods, but we must be able to evaluate his status, see if there are any changes in his organs and systems, uh, then undertake uh, the measures that are aimed at rehabilitation and recovery. One of the most important things is um, post-flight the science program, BDC and others. And what Mike pointed out is also quite important, public relations reports, that they have to prepare the reports about the, their work during flight, because each flight is basically a test flight. And during each flight, so there are different things, new systems are being worked on and developed in the medical systems, including. And we are also looking at the performance and functionality of different onboard systems. And so this post-flight stage also draws a lot of attention and uh, rehabilitation period including. Spasiba. One thing, just one. All <laughs> right. It can be more than one if you wish. I, I'm, I'm not an expert in how we rehabilitate people, but let's, ex <clears throat> let's explore the possibilities. One of the, th assuming people who are doing their job in that area come up with really great things to do, how do we test that they work uh, before the event? And a thought occurs to me you could do something really mundane like uh, bed rest them and then launch them to the moon. That might not seem fair to some of the astronauts. On the other hand, uh, if the station's still around, how about letting them uh, uh, go to the station for a few months and then uh, <coughs> as the crowning glory of that trip somehow or other get them off uh, to the moon and uh, let's see how they do. Uh, some practical approach to uh, testing our abilities to rehabilitate somebody on the Martian surface needs to be developed. Perhaps so. 
Just one short one. Is there any effort being made to uh, to uh, recruit people coming back from ISS and asking them to go through some representative first day on Mars tasks shortly after return? If it could be arranged, it might be a great idea. I guess if I could do anything, it would be we've developed decent countermeasures for orthostatic intolerance, but essentially none for the neurovestibular problem. Uh, for landing and for the shuttle that's an issue you know occasionally we have a pilot who will get into a PIO on the runway we've had pilots who who were disoriented enough they bang the shuttle in pretty hard uh, close to its close to its limits and uh, I'm sure when we go to Mars we'll just be monitoring systems but if early ambulation is important and crew performance is important and there could be contingencies occur with landing it would be nice if we could offer something that was a countermeasure uh, to the neural dis vestibular disorders that we see in our crew members. Okay, thank you very much. Um, at this point, uh, let's open up the discussion to <coughs> include the audience. Uh, Mike Fink mentioned that the uh, post-flight condition of each astronaut it's different in terms of the uh, rehabilitation program. But according to uh, Dr. Puchuev's comments, uh, the condition uh, seems to depend on the uh, amount and quality of exercise in flight. How do you think? Ah, my, and my second question is, uh, do you have any uh, special attention uh, for the uh, psychological rehabilitation? Uh, during post-flight phase? Yes, um, I think uh, by the time I f my, my first flight was uh, Expedition 9, and uh, through the experience of our uh, collaborative uh, work on Station Mir and the uh, International Space Station, I knew uh, just by watching my friends come back from missions that uh, the crews that exercised uh, the best uh, felt the best on their return. And uh, my fondest dream was to uh, get back in line again and uh, to go fly again, so I knew that it was in my own personal interest, not just for the longitudinal health studies or just general health and well-being, but also just professionally that uh, I should exercise because I personally uh, find exercise boring. I'd rather read a book, but I knew this was good for me. And so I, so I uh, exercised uh, per the protocols and had good communication uh, with my uh, team on the ground. And I, think I attribute uh, their efforts to keep me motivated and exercising for uh, a speedy recovery. And uh, thank goodness and uh, thanks to the system that I got uh, back in line again. I'm very grateful. But uh, so, uh, so the exercise is uh, very important and the amount of exercise and uh, not just uh, recipe protocols, but the continuous feedback of, of uh, talking with our conditioning and rehabilitation specialists while we're on board so that they can change the prescription. Uh, so the more we give them information and the more we have a good conversation, the more they can optimize our, our exercise. Uh, and uh, that's always a, a good thing. Uh, so that is, I think, one uh, key to success. As far as uh, looking at different uh, amount of people coming back, uh, uh, I have only seen one crew really come back, and that's my own experience. Uh, but I think there's a lot of us that have seen many, uh, many crews come back and can kind of make the comparisons. It's, uh, it's fascinating to hear the near unanimous agreement on the importance of neurovestibular recovery, both during reentry for piloted tasks and after 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 reentry. You know. When many of us started working on neurovestibular problems in space, the emphasis was entirely on the uh, space motion sickness onset after entry into orbit, something we now, I think, fully understand and have treatments, treatments for. Uh, it is important that the community recognize that there is such a field as vestibular rehabilitation. We do understand that you can go and adapt to an unusual environment by making head movements limited in limited velocity such that you do not become over, overwhelmingly sick. This is a solvable problem. There have been some preliminary results, uh, for example, from Neurolab, which are encouraging in this matter. 
But the first step is to have the community listen to what the panel has said today, that we do have a real problem of vestibular, neurovestibular responses during reentry and following the return. So thank you for the, bringing that to our attention. Uh, a, a question. Chuck, <laughs> Chuck, Chuck do you want to speak wanna, loudly? Or you don't have a mic? I, I, oh, okay, sorry. Zero, okay, yes, sir. Uh, a question about, and it relates to the uh, uh, perhaps the role of the flight surgeon. I always assume that, um, and I believe we all believe that role of flight surgeons be advocate for the astronaut health and safety of astronauts. And it, our role is to do everything and recommend all everything possible to make sure that uh, when we launch astronauts in space, they are emotionally, psychologically, and physically fit, that uh, they stay on the space station, they, we pres exercise prescription, and whatever other countermeasure we pr recommend is so that when they come back, we have mitigated as much as possible against the uh, adverse effect of spaceflight on the astronaut. So I heard the, the, the comment about good enough, uh, as perhaps as a new paradigm. It, is there the way we should go? Is that as opposed to be as much as possible in the best physical shape, just good enough will be good enough uh, from the astronaut point of view. And, and the other component is, I think Mike uh, talked about, you know, a very busy post-flight uh, period uh, program, perhaps not understanding, and uh, how do flight surgeons can help astronauts uh, uh, perhaps uh, maximize the benefit of a, a adequate post-flight uh, post period, and uh, how do we protect, as a flight surgeon, astronauts against themselves? astronaut being very motivated, passionate, driven, and result-oriented people. Well, as far as the, uh, you know, perfect versus good enough thing in the, in the pre-flight care, I'd be really happy if we just get to good enough <laughs> pre-flight. And our, uh, our, um, our doctors are not the problem. I mean, they are working as hard as they can to try and make things um, just right for the crews, but we have a very complicated geopolitical uh, team that we're trying to work, and the stressors that are involved on the families and the crews are um, are significant. Uh, and so, if you can just get the crews to space, w once they're in space, it's like vacation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the hard part is everything you go through on the, on the way there. Uh, and then the rehabilitation is almost fun compared to pre-flight training. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think the docs really need to do much different except just keep, uh, you know, keep doing what they're doing. Um, I, I've been really uh, proud and happy to associate with uh, all the flight docs that I've been lucky enough to work with. They've really been on the cruise team. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Perhaps uh, just a quick comment. Uh, before the next question, uh, with regard to the relationship between astronauts and, and the flight surgeons, I think there will be a paradigm shift in that relationship if you embed one of the flight surgeons, an astronaut flight surgeon, in the crew. And uh, hopefully the administration of that process would be trusting enough to let that go forward. Uh, as it does, or as it did in my squadron when I was a marine flight surgeon. Uh, it's, it's a different relationship. Uh, even though we have crew surgeons now who follow you pre-flight and post-flight, uh, they're really not committed to the mission in the way someone would be, say, going to Mars, who is going to go with you. I wanted to add that I wanted to add that a crew surgeon is taking the most active part and protects astronauts and cosmonauts during post-flight stage. He participates in putting together the rehabilitation program post-flight, um, evaluates work and rest schedule, he evaluates the workload for the crew post-flight because each person or each specialist who works with the cosmonauts or astronauts has his own objective, the clinic 
called care specialists want to get the information about his health. The scientists want to get the post-flight data and complete their science program. Systems specialists want to talk to the cosmonaut and find out what he thinks, how the systems work on board. And then the, the circumstances, the uh, crew surgeon is the effectively a buffer between uh, the crew member and all the other participants clamoring for his attention in this process. Yes, sir. I, um, I just wanted to uh, follow up on the comment that uh, Sam and Rich were making as, as far as the clinical frustration with the need to to deal uh, to depend on the tincture of time as far as uh, this nervous tubular recovery. Certainly, one of the things that we've learned in the field in the last few years uh, from the nervous tubular rehab community is the value of sort of applying some of the things that, frankly, we've learned from the sports, uh, sports medicine community, the value of cross-training and the value of, of uh, learning how to learn, which some of you might have encountered as a concept, perhaps in tennis instruction, uh, learning strategies. And it's been found that, that uh, exposing um, uh, vestibular patients to mild challenges that force them to change their, their postural strategy really does accelerate their ability to learn. And, you know, it's been suggested that, that to some degree that could be done either pre-flight or even, even in flight to, uh, to give you a broader repertoire. Um, one issue that has come up in some of this discussion, though, is whether or not all the treadmill running that we're doing in flight is in some sense negative training. You know, all the problems that we encounter, people can sort of walk, it's, but it's turning corners and maintaining balance. And of course, when you're running on a treadmill, your balance is kind of guaranteed, uh, or at least to some degree, or in a very different uh, biomechanical way uh, by the bungees that you wear. Um, so is this, uh, you know, is there a toxicity to our exercise countermeasure that sh we should be uh, thinking about? I know Vanessa and I have talked about this a lot. And Ken and I have discussed it a bit, but what do you all think? Well, I'll give you one anecdote. On orbit, because of the limitations on the treadmill, I was limited to running uh, no faster than five and a half miles per hour. And uh, that was because uh, my gait is really bad and I, and I shake the station too much. And, and uh, what I found w when I came back was um, that gait was um, programmed into me. And, and still now, if I, if I go much faster than that, it's like I'm running on oatmeal. Uh, I, 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 something has been programmed in, in my system um, that uh, was very difficult to, to overcome from that time uh, being limited to that speed on the, the treadmill. Now, to be fair, I never ran a whole lot faster than that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But it, but it was really interesting. If I if I deviated much from that speed, uh, the the effort seemed to go. The perceived effort went way up. But if I was on that speed, I could go forever. You're familiar with multiple studies now looking at aerobic fitness and and nausea and vomiting in the motion environment. And the more aerobically fit you are, the more likely you are to have well, have uh, have. Uh, uh, Problems with uh, nervous But we did look at that in the cruise, right? Don't use aerobic regimen. Yeah. Yeah. We keep telling this. I understand. Well, that, when you look at any countermeasure, though, there's a lot more to it than just running and keeping your legs fit. I look at what's the opportunity cost, how long does it take. I look at how long it you know, takes, what's the opportunity cost. But don't, don't sell short the enjoyment factor for uh, things like the treadmill that can be very important psychologically. You know, if you had a Bill Gregory or a Sonny Williams or, or you know, Sir Bill MacArthur, for example, these folks would, would not do well if you said, oh, you can't go run on a treadmill. Oh, I, I, and <laughs> so there's, there's multiple aspects besides just keeping fit that, that certain people do. Well, we can enhance the treadmill experience, though, by because right now we, there's nothing to do the treadmill except watch the little thing in front of you. And we don't move our head. We just run straight ahead. What if we have uh, TV monitors that simulate us running around a, a, a corner? Now, of course, we can't run around a corner, but all of a sudden we're, we're cross-training our our visual pathways uh, along with our, our our balance so sorry to interrupt but we, we uh, there's ways to to de detoxify this if you will uh, by by in increasing our visual aspects that we really don't have aboard station right now what just one other thing about any exercise as everybody knows if you have exercise programs you occasionally get injuries with exercise programs and and uh, there's been quite a few uh, of our ISS crew members who've come back with 
certain injuries uh, like hip injuries that don't seem to get healed or take a couple of years to get healed. There's a lot of a lot of things still to look at, I think, to optimize the countermeasure program, balancing again time and injuries and, and what you're getting out of it. Uh, Ken Baldwin here. Um, I want to really congratulate the panel for their upfrontness, their bluntness, and telling it like it is. And I've been in situations on, in chairing science committees, advisory committees at headquarters, and I have been getting at the highest level Basically, we don't need this, we don't need that. Exercise is not important because of individuals from the astronaut corps that have been on assignment to headquarters and planting a perspective that doesn't match what I have heard from this distinguished panel. So I congratulate you. Uh, if I hope were, I didn't do that while I was at headquarters. <laughs> well, I'm, not, I'm not putting anything on you, Ken. Ken, you're not the bad guy. You're not the bad guy. But there are some I have some suspicion of. But if I were going into uh, a, a lunar sortie or going to Mars right now, I would be concerned because I don't know what the agency is planning for the uh, the types of exercise devices the the uh, um, the ability to have flexibility in your training which is what a lot of you are pointing to that you would like this and that and so forth in order to round out your experience and i think this is very important and i see uh, uh, a process that is unfolding that is not going to allow the astronaut to have this flexibility and the diversity of trying to alter the remodeling that's going on in the vestibular system, the remodeling that's going on in the circulatory system, and the remodeling that is going on in the musculoskeletal system. The things that you people are describing fall into the process of remodeling of these systems, and while you're alive and kicking when you return, I have really come to appreciate the fact that you don't get yourself back to near normal by trying to accelerate a recovery process because if you do it you're going against how the the, the systems have to remodel on the back end of the training paradigm so we've got a lot to do here if we're going to maintain physiological homeostasis and fitness for duty when we get out there and it begins with having all the ingredients to keep you guys in, in normal functional capability. Uh, I feel like uh, very pleased that uh, our panel on countermeasure, which was not very successful yesterday, uh, became uh, like um, uh, added by this excellent discussion today, uh, which showed actually how much the state of uh, a cosmonaut and astronaut uh, after flight depends on what he was doing in space. And things which are told today and I kept listening, and I was surprising that nobody talked about one thing, that it is known that physical exercises, physical load, uh, very much depend on what kind of load you are using. It is not just you can put the sack on your back and that is enough. Not at all. Every kind of exercise, regimen of exercise, and so on, has its specific effect that is known for sports physiology. People, for years, like Dr. Jennings said, that when you are running long, you have a vestibular, but it was known for sports physiology people for ages that marathon people don't have orthostatic at all and very bad in vestibular as well. Because, because the marathon 
uh, um, arrangement trends something else, you know, and like preset the whole system for something which is antagonistic to orthostatic tolerance and so on. And sprinter on the opposite are very good in orthostats. And therefore, uh, like in on the Russian side, uh, we don't recommend people very much. And whoever listened my talk to my cosmonaut during flight, they heard that I kept saying, don't do marathon. That's not good for you. You better follow the regimen which were, they were not taken from, from above, from sky. They were developed in very long and very extended series of on-ground experiments with batteries in 70s, when they were tried different regimens, absolutely. Resistive exercise, resistive plus, plus marathon, resistive plus sprinters, and so on and so on. And there was developed the very elaborate uh, regimen uh, of uh, training on board. And you heard Shannon yesterday who said that she was just following this regimen and she came back, and she came back excellent. That's everybody knows. But, of course, we can talk, you know, everybody has his own culture, as we say, that he has his own uh, background, and therefore we never will uh, uh, will uh, convince each other when we will just speaking, you know, without the data. We need data. And we, we miss this data just because we cannot how to say, uh, to, to make collaborative studies. And uh, th that is very easy, as a matter of fact, because all the cosmonauts, all the astronauts, they are individuals, and they never follow, to a full extent, th th those regimens which we recommend, because they are not rabid. They have their own experience, their own understanding, their own belief, and therefore, they're doing experiment which I would never be allowed to do. I would not tell, I cannot tell him, don't do our regimen, do something else. I, have, I will keep telling him, do our regimen. Why don't you do our regimen? But he will do whatever he wants. <laughs> when he comes, exactly, <laughs> believe me, when he, because he's not young people. Now, our cosmonauts are not young people. They already have experience and their own understanding, what they have to do, and so on. So when they come, and, and, and additionally, during flight, they don't have feedback about their state. This is the other things which I think we, mi we are missing, and we need to establish the, the system which will allow cosmonaut, astronaut, to test themselves, their own fitness, their own re readiness to come down, and so on. We don't have it now. And we are flying 30 years, we don't have still this, the, this system. But what I want to say, the main thing of what I, I wanted to say again and again, that all these people, like to, to, today it was said that uh, Vladimir Ivanovich uh, rehab, rehabbed more than 30 cosmonauts. Actually, he rehabbed m more than, I don't know how many, because 50 only were on Mir, now 16, it is already 66, on salute station six and seven, we flew together. This is another. So I think it's somewhere um, about 80 long-term people, long-term flying people. We were rehabbing, rehabilitated. After they were doing something in there, and every one of them actually give us the report and we watching them during flight, we know what they're doing there. As especially now when we have very good down, downloading, we know exactly how do they do, how do they run, and so on and so on, running and so on. Now, we need to have a system of, uh, uh, of assessment of the state of their different system after flight. And maybe then, when we will do this, and we will do this analysis, what was in flight and what we have after, in the group of people like 50, 80, and so, so, uh, and so on, I think we will be much more capable to say why and where this great variability of states occur came from. 
because uh, today we don't have data, and it is much more expensive in time and in and in money just to try to uh, to try all of them to do this uh, operation or that operation and to see how suitable they are. I do believe in what I was taught to that there is nothing more practical on the earth than the good theory, and we have to develop theory. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody on the panel who wanted to make a comment at this point? No. Um, actually, before uh, going to the back, I think Dr. Bogomolov uh, had the microphone temporarily for a while and has it back <laughs> in <there. laughs> so, uh, First of all, I would like to thank you for a very productive discussion. I fully side with what has been said by Dr. Pachuev. I think what is important is to emphasize the issues that require decisions or solutions, the ones that are still unresolved. First of all, the unresolved issues we have are related to return of either incapacitated or sick crew members, where we have to perform not only recovery measures, but have to have a treatment for those crew members. Uh, today, the vehicle we have, Soyuz or shuttle, are not fit for the injured, incapacitated or sick crew members. Such efforts have been made, but I don't think we pay close attention to those efforts. How we will perform those procedures, how those injuries or intoxication will develop when we have rehabilitation, it's a still a big question, and this issue has to be studied very carefully by our medical community. This is one comment. Second comment, what I think is important is the rehabilitation, the recovery after the flight for future expedition to the Moon or Mars will require different approaches for recovery and rehabilitation programs. Because in order to work on the surface of Mars, we have to perform recovery measures before the crew members can function well. We have to have enough resources, and the crew members will have to have enough strength to fulfill the Martian program. So these are the tasks for the future. I just wanted to outline them, because the current practice does not cover all the issues for the future. We don't know everything for the future. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dave? I just wanted to make a couple of comments on what Anessa was uh, mentioning earlier on, and it's with regard to this whole role of exercise and countermeasures and things like that. And I think uh, particularly as we get older in the astronaut corps, it's important to look at countermeasures as individually tailored countermeasures, that the countermeasures that I may have used 10 years ago when I last flew in space are different than the countermeasures I'm using this time, and that exercise is one of many factors that plays into that. But it's absolutely critical to develop this ahead of time. You can't discover exercise as a countermeasure when you're in space. And this has to be built into our training program. One of the things that we're focusing on very much now is the performance of spacewalks by crew members in their 50s compared to crew members in their 40s. And certainly when I was training for EVA 10 years ago, the type of physical conditioning that I had 10 years ago is different than the type of physical conditioning that I have right now. We also recognize that EVA training is associated with risk of injury in and of itself, whether you're doing that in a microgravitational environment or in a gravitational environment, and that reiterates again the need to be in appropriate physical conditioning. And uh, one of the things that I think is really exciting now is looking at performing planetary spacewalks and the types of studies that need to be done to enable us to optimize human performance in a partial gravitational environment. 
Right now we're looking at the effects of varying center of gravity in your gait when you're performing a spacewalk in a simulated lunar environment. This is critical not only from a neurovestibular perspective, but also from a musculoskeletal perspective, being able to optimize the biomechanics of the tasks that we're performing in these zero-g environments. So I certainly uh, support Ken and his comments and thank Anessa for bringing this very important issue up about the effects of how we change and age in the types of countermeasures that we're doing. But this type of work is absolutely critical for us as we begin to go forward looking at lunar return and going on to Mars. Yes, thank you. Are there other questions? Yes, Nick. I have a quite different question. Um, the first uh, return to the moon, or certainly the first Martian mission, will be quite um, uh, publicity-wise and will, will create a great deal of the fame and glory kinds of issues for the returnees. And I'm wondering what you all think about the best way to prepare astronauts and to help them cope with the stresses of having to come back and then deal with the media, deal with all the fame and glory they'll be receiving, which are wonderful on one hand, but is actually also very stressful. Uh, just a, a quick thought on that. Uh, I'm not uh, so familiar with all the fame and glory and, and such. We were just Expedition 9, not Expedition 1 or, or 6 even. But the, the, the one, there, it has to be tailored again. To, we have to understand each, each different crew member, each person's going to uh, deal with these stressors uh, differently. I know one uh, technique that would work for me is uh, including my family. If I had to go meet the Queen of England or something like that, I'd like to at least bring my family along so I wouldn't be far, long farther. And we need to develop, which the answer is, I think, uh, practically speaking, is we need to address this ahead of time. Uh, we crew members need to be uh, psychologically smart in that we understand what stresses us and how we relieve those stresses uh, ahead of time and then have a good conversation with our flight docs and flight psychologists as we go through these things and that will help with the psychological rehabilitation whether it's uh, the glories of, of uh, lunar or Mars or just uh, the a average everyday uh, crew that comes back from space station. It's still the same kind of progress, but we just can't ignore it and say, oh, magically you're back and, uh, you know, what are you going to do now? Uh, Dave. I just wanted to play off the theme that Ellen Baker brought up. Uh, there's a, uh, we've been talking about, uh, around the exercise of the nervous stimular, we heard a lot about inter-individual differences in, in return. Uh, this issue of establishing uh, whether these differences are state-like or trade-like, whether they're related to to using a countermeasure or whether they're predisposed vulnerabilities that are biological differences among individuals are critically important, especially for the scientists to be able to help the program. And to go back to Ellen's point about making best use of the clinical data, at this point we've got enough people going into space repeatedly that we have an opportunity now, it strikes me, to get systematic uh, evaluations of the magnitude of their response, say neurovestibular mm -hmm. or uh, yeah, in their motor mo muscle system, when they're back, and a, a, a large enough aggregate body of people, we can then do interclass correlations and establish how much of that variance is trait-like versus state-like. And that's a huge step forward for knowing where to focus our energies on trying to identify biomarkers or the basis for the differences if they're trait-like, phenotypic, or if they're truly state-like, and all of this is a matter of having the right kind of exercise available at the right amount in space flight or whatever the countermeasure is. But it actually would be enormously valuable now with repeated exposure to space flight the same individuals to get information on whether they're having the same reaction in the nervous vestibular system, the muscle system, and other systems when they return to the flight. Thank you. Uh, do any of the panelists want to make a comment on that? No. Almost all of the questions have uh, been coming from this half of the auditorium. Is there anybody over here who would like to ask any questions of our distinguished panelists? Or any of the panelists who would like to make uh, any comments uh, or feel that there might be issues that they'd like to address that we haven't touched upon that may be of interest? One quick comment. I think we've discussed uh, 
selection and the ability of selection processes to rule out various kinds of problems. Uh, maybe even to the extent that uh, we uh, protect against re rehabilitation problems, but uh, I think that's somewhat mythical, at least given our current technologies. And uh, while I would support uh, a fairly robust effort in keeping up with the standards and trying to develop new techniques which are appropriate, say, to a Mars mission, uh, be cautious. I remember one of my managers at one point said, uh, Sam, uh, are these uh, things you're writing uh, standards or guidelines? And uh, uh, he was firmly in the guidelines category. And he had a lot of pressures on what he was doing as well in terms of the politics uh, of what was going on about who would fly when. and. Uh, so I, I think be cautious about the convenient mythology that selection standards can solve your problems in, in our arena. OK, thank you. So one last attempt to muster up questions. I'd like to just uh, bring up a, a, just a quick follow-on. We were talking about neurovestibular uh, kinds of issues. And uh, there's a, we have a, we talked about cultures and generations yesterday. Uh, I've noticed with my younger brothers and sisters, uh, and my son, in fact, uh, playing video games. And I just want to bring up the fact that we exercise our muscle, muscular skeletal systems, and we have that, but we really haven't been exercising our neurovestibular systems for six months. And uh, these are we need to think of ways, and maybe video games, maybe it's something else, but uh, in non-gravitational environments. And uh, it would be interesting, I think, and productive uh, to, to think about uh, ways that we can exercise that. And I, I think we can get some real uh, bang for the buck on that, because uh, I think the magic pills that uh, you asked, you know, first, you know, things that we want, want to solve. And I think it's uh, some of the neurovestibular issues uh, that's uh, kind of the long pole in the tent. We have our strength. <laughs> We have good, fairly good skeletons when we come back, and if we can somehow exercise these neurovestibular systems a little bit better, uh, I think we, we, it'll uh, prove well for us. I think that's an excellent comment, and one way to do that might be the intermittent use of uh, what we call artificial gravity in combination with exercise. And uh, uh, even though that program seems to be uh, somewhat uh, off the shelf at the moment, I still think it's very deserving of our attention, uh, at least in our community. And uh, if we can't get the managers to listen to us, maybe we need to talk a little bit louder about it. OK, well, I would like to uh, thank the panelists for uh, an excellent discussion. And I think uh, both panels uh, really were uh, very interesting and uh, fruitful. So thank you very much, and this ends this session.